You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 121. This week I would like to thank Patrick, Cornelius, Gary, and Francis for their support on Patreon, where they have now unlocked access to all of our Patreon-only episodes. You can find out more information at patreon.com slash history of the great war. This week we come now, at last, to something I've been referring to during all of these episodes on the action on the Italian front, the Battle of Caporetto. Caporetto was the climax of the fighting on the Italian front during the war, and I think it actually occupies the same place as the spring 1918 offensives do on the Western Front. The Central Powers were about to give it their all to greatly damage the Italians, and to do this they would finally utilize a large number of German troops. The result of this attack would be the largest gain and loss of territory during the war in northern Italy, and it would also result in the almost complete collapse of the Italians. Here is Vanda Wilcox from her article, Morale and Battlefield Performance at Caporetto, 1917, to give a great breakdown on the stages of the battle. Quote, The Battle of Caporetto is best understood by breaking down the month of October 24th to November 26th into a variety of stages. From October 24th to November 3rd came the initial breakthrough in the Italian route, characterized by disorderly mass flight and desertion, with huge number of prisoners taken as the Second Army fell back to the Tagliamento, followed by the forced retreat of the Third and Fourth Armies to the Piave. By 3rd November, the situation was changing and the second phase of the battle began. Though still retreating until November 12th, the troops began to reorganize, resist, and fight back. The final phase of the battle from November 12th to 18th witnessed a renewed Austro-Hungarian attack with reinvigorated efforts to break the now-stable Italian lines before the battle's conclusion on November 26th, end quote. We will be covering Caporetto over the course of two episodes, with the first today focusing mainly on the planning and preparations for the attack, although we will close out this episode with some of the initial advances as the attack began. Next week, we will then follow the attack through to its conclusion, and then talk about what it meant for the Italian front leading into 1918. The 11th battle had been something of a wake-up call for the Austrian leaders. Emperor Karl and the new commander-in-chief General Strausenberg decided to reach out to the Germans for help. To this end, Karl would write to the Kaiser the following, quote, The experience we have acquired in the 11th battle has led me to believe that we should fare far worse in a 12th. My commanders and brave troops have decided that such an unfortunate situation might be anticipated by an offensive. We have not the necessary means as regards to troops. The goal of both leaders was to have the Germans send more troops to the Eastern Front so that the Austrians could move troops to the Isonzo. The initial plan for Karl and Strassenberg specifically excluded direct German participation due to concerns about the morale of the Austro-Hungarian troops, something that was already on a razor's edge. However, this was not what the Germans wanted. The German general staff were already looking at the Italian front as an area for action in late 1917, but instead of just letting their allies mount an offensive, something that they probably doubted their capability to do, they wanted to be more involved. And by involved, I of course mean they wanted to control the entire operation. Karl and Strassenberg were persuaded that this was the better plan, which in hindsight was almost certainly the correct move, and the Germans sent a group of officers to begin recon and planning for the operation. 
These officers included some of the very best experts in mountain warfare, something that would be critical to the upcoming operation. The attack plan that would develop would focus around the little town of Caporetto. This was to the north of most of the fighting we've discussed on the Asanzo so far. It was north of Garizia, the Bansiza, and Tolmin. This was an ideal area for what was being planned, because it was the start of a valley that pushed out through the mountains and out into the lowlands on the other side. This would give the attack a valley of roughly a kilometer wide to make its focal point. If they were successful, they would be through most of the Italian defenses, although it might expose them to attacks on the flanks if the rest of the Italian defenses held. I highly recommend that everybody check out the link to the map I put in the show notes so that you can sort of see what I'm talking about. I find it interesting that the attack would take place so far away from most of the other fighting on the Italian front. The army that would be created to take the primary role in this attack was called the 14th Army. It was created out of seven German and somewhere between three and eight Austro-Hungarian divisions. And I know you may be thinking why I give such a big range, three to eight. Well, I have four different numbers from four different sources, which I agree is pretty ridiculous. I think it comes down to maybe a few factual errors in terms of which Austro-Hungarian divisions they were counting, but in all honesty, the exact number of troops doesn't really matter. Either way, most of them were rounded up from other fronts and sent on their way to Caporetto. Many of these divisions were specifically selected for the task. On the German side, they basically assembled all of their best mountain troops for the attack, including the 117th Infantry Division, which had spent a good portion of their time in the Carpathians, the 1st Württemberg Infantry Division, and the Alpine Corps, one of the premier units of the entire German army. On the Austrian side, the troops would be the highest quality still available to the army, The 1st Corps, under the command of German German General Krauss, was heavily outfitted with specially trained and equipped assault units, and they would also have the assistance of almost 450 artillery pieces, more than was made available to a single Austrian corps at any other point during the war. The 1st Corps would be the tip of the spear of the 14th Army. This infusion of troops brought the Germans and Austrians as close as they would come in the last two years of the war to parity with the Italians. On the whole front, they would still be greatly outnumbered, though. However, it was hoped that they would also be able to utilize troops on the Asiago to the west and Asanzo to the south if the 14th Army really got rolling. The plan for these troops and for the attack would develop around Caporetto, with the goal of being to throw back the Italians at least 40 kilometers. Just taking territory was not the measure of success for this attack, though. Instead, the goal was to harm the Italians so much that they would have issues trying to launch an attack later in 1917, and even into the spring of 1918, hopefully. This would then play into the hands of the Germans, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who were, who were in the opening planning stages for their spring 1918 Western Front Offensive, and they wanted to make sure that their southern flank was secure. The attack would go forward in late October, with the initial date being October 22nd, but it would be pushed back to the 24th due to the ever-present weather issues in this area of Europe. Trying to launch around this time would require a pretty quick turnaround, with the 22nd only being six weeks after planning started. The high-level concept of the attack was a two-pronged assault, with the northern army of the attack being commanded by General Krauss. This arm would attack north of Caporetto on the slopes of Mount Rambon and move south towards the city. To the south, General von Dominsigen would attack from Tolmin and the bridgehead that the Austrians had over the Asanzo there. The Germans tried very hard to keep their involvement a secret, with transports only going up to the front at night and units at the front being given Austrian uniforms. They knew that it would be impossible to completely hide the presence of their troops, though, and therefore they also played some deception games by moving German troops north to the Trentino. These efforts would at least some at least be somewhat successful. The Germans also brought their own planes, which were generally far superior to what the Italians had. These were used to keep the Italians from discovering the full scale of the buildup of troops, and I'm sure that the Austrian infantry were ecstatic to have them on the front. One thing that you see a lot in Austrian stories of the war is how dominant the Italian air force was over the battlefield. Often, the Austrians would feel completely helpless and vulnerable to attacks from the air. Of course, these preparations were joined by the artillery, which would play a big role in the attack. 
While there was rough parity between the German and Austrian guns and the Italian guns on the entirety of the front, the Italian guns were spread out elsewhere, and there was a big concentration to the south on the Carso, whereas the Germans and Austrians could concentrate their guns, giving them a considerable advantage at the point of attack. The plan for these guns was to begin the bombardment just a few hours before the infantry attack, with the firing beginning at about 2 a.m. and the attack at about 9 a.m. They would begin by hitting the Italian artillery with a new mixture of phosgene and diphenylchlorazine, which was then followed by about five hours of traditional shelling. Once the attack went forward and was hopefully successful, Borivik would launch his forces into an attack to the south, which would hopefully turn into a general advance against the Italians. The operation would be given the codename Waffentru, or Brothers in Arms. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash gw50 and use code gw50 to get 50% off. That's code gw50 at factormeals.com slash gw50 to get 50% off. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee, or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power Retail Sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Now let's switch over to the Italian side. Cadorna had judged that, after the effort they had put forward for the 11th battle, his army was done until 1918. In mid-September, he told all of his commanders that they would not be launching any further offensives in 1917, and they should switch to the defensive and work on their positions. This put the entire army into a kind of passive and overconfident mood. They thought with that their advantage in numbers, which after the 11th battle were even more pronounced, they did not need to worry about an Austrian attack. This feeling filtered up to the commanders, with even higher-ranking Italians like Capello not taking defensive preparations seriously. This feeling was even worse on the northern end of the Asanzo front. After all of their failures in the north, the Italians believed that the mountains north of Bansiza would create their own defensive areas, and therefore they did not need to put much effort into fortifications in this area. This was, of course, the exact area where more effort was needed. There were also issues in the northern area, due to units and commanders being frequently rotated in and out of the area, since it was seen as an inactive sector, and this created a good amount of confusion. Even with the deficiencies in their preparations, the Italians still had more men than their enemies, much more if they could discover the plans for the attack and concentrate their forces, so let's talk about what they knew about the upcoming attack. This was, of course, the all-important question. Even though the Austrians and Germans tried so hard to keep evidence of the coming attack under wraps, the Italians would end up knowing a good deal about it. They knew that there was some kind of build-up happening on the northern Asanzo. More critically, they knew that there were German troops there. However, Cadorna did not believe that the Austrians would launch an attack this late in the year, that in fact that they could not launch such an attack. Therefore, while he advised his commanders to shore up their defenses, he did not take any other steps to prepare for an attack. The Italians were also very backward when it came to defensive strategies by this point in the war. They did not have a ton of experience on the defensive, and they still put most of their troops in the front lines, where they were easily cut off and chewed up by the new infiltration tactics that the Germans and Austrians would be experimenting with. This was much... 
This was much different than the elastic defenses that the Germans were using and other armies were experimenting with by this point in the war. But it should be noted that it isn't that dissimilar from what the British were doing in 1917 and into 1918, which would cost them so dearly in the spring. Even when the artillery fire started, Cadorna and Capello did not properly respond because they were convinced that this was just a diversion from the main effort that would come later on the Carso and Bainciza. That artillery fire would begin at 2 a.m. on October 24th. The fire opened along a 30-kilometer front, and on this entire front, the weight of shells that were hitting the Italian lines were greater than anything they had seen. Their first targets were the artillery and the communication hubs, for which they detailed about 2,000 poison gas shells. By this point in the war, the Italians all had gas masks. The Austrians had already used gas a few times. And these masks were designed to protect against the most common gases, which were generally a mixture of phosgene and chlorine. However, they were not designed to protect against the precise type of chlorine gas that the Germans were firing, which was diphenylchlorazine. Apparently, this gas was a very strong vomiting agent, and could possibly penetrate the gas masks of the time, and cause the wearer to start violently sneezing. Now, violently sneezing is obviously a problem when you're wearing a gas mask, and it could allow the phosgene to get into the mask. Whether or not this could actually penetrate a properly prepared mask seems to be up for debate, but it's possible that many Italian masks were just defective. Either way, the gas caused a serious problem for the artillery. It basically filled the entire Flilch Basin with the gas, and it caused serious problems for the Italians. Thousands would be dead before the real artillery barrage would even begin. Once the gas was fired, the artillery switched over to normal high-explosive shells and went to work. Over the coming hours, they would focus on the Italian positions and strong points, and many of these would be reduced to almost nothing due to the heavy fire. The attack began early in the morning at about 8.30, and they were led by assault troops from both the German and Austrian armies. For the Austrians, one of their point divisions was the 22nd, which was one that had been recruited locally and made up of troops that had no love for the Italians. They were followed by divisions like the 8th Edelweiss Division, which was mostly comprised of the elite Kaiserjäger. Right from the start, things were going well. In the north, the Austrians attacked and quickly pushed through the Italian positions. When they arrived at the first village, which was their objective for the early morning, they found it completely empty. This was not even the area of greatest progress, though. Instead, that was in the south, on the Asanso near Tolmin. Here, the Germans and Austrians pushed forward below the summit of Mount Mersley, a height that the Italians had tried multiple times to capture. All along the sector, strong points that were built at lower elevations were simply bypassed by the Germans who pushed along the high ground. By noon, there were German units already halfway to Caporetto. Inside that town, the Italian officers were desperately trying to get control of the soldiers who were retreating through the town, but they had no choice but to allow anybody without a rifle to continue on their way, otherwise they would just clog up the roads. News of this policy, of course, began to filter back up the road, and anybody with a rifle probably quickly considered tossing them aside so that they would be allowed to pass on. At the river near Caporetto, Italian engineers were trying to rig up explosives on the bridges to slow the advance. At around 2 p.m., the forward elements reached the edges of Caporetto, and about an hour and a half later, the engineers blew the bridges. Unfortunately, this didn't slow the advance very much, and by 4 p.m., Caporetto had been captured. From the south, the German division arrived, only to see that the town was already in in Austrian hands. All around this area of the attack by nightfall, all of the critical objectives, be they villages or towns or just strategic heights, were in German or Austrian hands. The first day had been a disaster for the Italians. Somewhere around 30,000 soldiers had been captured, let alone all those who were dead or wounded. Many artillery batteries had never even fired a shot because they had no idea what was happening and never received any orders that would cause them to jump into action. This type of chaos and confusion filtered out through all of the units of the Italian 2nd Army. Abandoned equipment, weapons, artillery pieces, basically anything that could be left behind was left behind to litter the roads. On the 25th, it got even worse for the Italians, because the weather cleared up. Without snow and fog, which had slowed the German progress the day before, the Germans and Austrians accelerated. 
By the second day, after the second army's collapse accelerated, the Austrians now had a new and unique problem to deal with. It was not stiffening Italian resistance or even logistical problems associated with an advance, but instead it was simply too many prisoners. This was not a common problem during the war. But even those Italian units that were resisting often found themselves surrounded by enemies both in front and behind. On the 25th, as the advance continued, the logistical issues did begin to mount, with the infantry outrunning the artillery and their supplies. This continued even though von Bello, who was commanding the German forces, detailed more troops than were necessary to clearing out the remaining Italian units from the mountains. Many of these troops could have been bypassed without any real negative consequences, but at least he had some really good mountain troops available to make it quick. A slowdown like this, coupled with outrunning the artillery, caused most attacks to stall during the war, but it didn't here. The reason for this was simply how broken the Italian units were. They were simply just not capable of providing the resistance necessary to stop the attack. One of the units that was still advancing was the Württemberg Mountain Battalion, and I bring this battalion up to continue our series of famous World War II officers making the name for themselves in World War I. In this mountain battalion was none other than the Desert Fox himself, Erwin Rommel, who was at this point a lieutenant. Even after all of the action of the Second World War, Rommel would continue to believe that this action was the high point of his career. His discussions and portrayals of what was happening on the mountainside make for some very good reading, even if you have to take them with a little bit of a grain of salt. One of his stories revolves around a few German soldiers capturing hundreds of Italians, which was not as rare of an occurrence during these days of confusion as you might think. All along the front, small units of German and Austrian soldiers were capturing entire companies, battalions, and even regiments without having to fire a shot. For Cadorna, the 26th would be the day that he finally realized that things were starting to fall apart. With such a catastrophic breakthrough happening in the north, all of the Italian troops in the south were in danger of having all of their troops cut off, and because of this, Cadorna ordered a general retreat to the Tagliamento River, the next major river after the Isonzo, with the retreat to begin on the 27th. It was also at this point that the Germans and Austrians planned to end their offensive on the Tagliamento. However, they now needed to decide how far they were going in this attack. Nobody really believed that the attack would be this successful. By this point in the war, if you believed that it was possible to precipitate the kind of complete and total collapse of an army that was, being happen- that was happening right now. Because of this, they were not exactly sure how much they wanted to continue. To keep the advance going would require more troops and more resources. Now, the Austrians, of course, wanted to keep piling them in, pulling more troops from the Russian front or wherever they could. But Ludendorff and the Germans were less gung-ho. Von Bello met with his commanders on the 26th and had to fight off suggestions that the army wheel south and drive for the coast. This might have trapped a good portion of the Italians that were on the Asanzo, but it would have committed the Germans to a lengthy and prolonged offensive campaign. After much discussion, the original goal still stood, and Von Bello had Ludendorff's full backing on this. The Germans would drive to the Tagliamento as soon as possible, at which point the troops would be sent back to the Western Front before the end of the year. Due to their desire to stick to the original plan, the Germans and Austrians would end up leaving some opportunities on the table, but this should not take away from the great position they were in on the 26th. They were charging forward, driving the Italians in front of them, and it looked like nothing would be able to stop them. Next episode, the attack will continue and we will see if the Italians can throw together anything that can stop them.